Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I am here to play through the first reconnaissance initial solo scenario of Mage Knight. So this scenario is designed to walk you through most of the basic mechanisms of the game, things you can do with your cards, all that. So we're going to do it, and I'm going to give you the full explanation of everything as we go. I did a setup video yesterday, and I do want to just make a couple clarifications. Um, I've been playing out of the ultimate box, and it's not set up the way that my beloved original Mage Knight is set up. <laughs> so um, I remembered that you needed to take out some cards from the Advanced Actions deck, but I also forgot that all the expansions are tossed together in Ultimate because I kind of keep them a little bit separate in my own box. So for the Advanced Actions, just take out cards 65 through 80, make those your Advanced Action deck, and you're all good. So you'll have a bunch of higher number cards that are from the expansions. Don't worry about them right now. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about. I actually just play with my whole stack of skill tokens and then just remove them as they show up. But I forgot to tell you, every hero has an interactive skill as well as a cooperative one. And the interactive skill is something that you're not going to want to use in a solo game because there's no other players to interact with. So since Goldix is my dummy deck and Tovac is my main, I've pulled the interactive and cooperative skills from both their piles so you can see. So here's Tovac right here, Goldix right here. The black mask is going to be an interactive skill. You do not need it. The white mask or helmet is going to be your cooperative skill. You can just go ahead and leave that in the pile. There are player's aid cards that tell you what everything does and I will go through all the skills that we encounter with you in detail as we play. The last thing that we're gonna do before we start playing is roll the mana dice. I'm gonna go put them on the day board, which is to the left of me right now. You'll see them again shortly, but you take three dice. And these are our mana for the first turn. It's not a bad setup. We have green, white, and gold mana. So these are the dice that we've rolled that'll be our mana pool for this first turn. We will go through how to maintain your mana very shortly. But for now, this is the mana that I have access to. The white and the green mana are basic colors as are blue and red. Gold is special. Gold mana only works in the daytime, which fortunately it's daytime right now, and it's essentially a wild. So I can spend this gold as a mana of any color of my choosing during the daytime. At night, it's depleted and is not effective. At night, there's a special mana, a black mana, and that one does not act as a wild the way that the gold does, but instead it allows you access to the most powerful versions of your spells. So day and night each have something special about them in terms of mana, which we'll talk about more. For now, these are going on the day board and you'll see them when I spend them. But before we get going, the goal of the first reconnaissance introductory scenario is to discover a city. That's it. We just explore these tiles until we discover the one that has a city on it. We will get a higher score depending on how much fame and leveling up I managed to do along the way. So there's definitely an incentive to discover and explore. I mean, that's really the point of the scenario. But the ultimate goal is once I overturn a tile that has a city on it, we are done for this time. I actually really like that as a requirement because it just lets you mess around with your cards, choose what to do. In a multiplayer scenario with more than one player working on the, the project of finding a city, you will have a day, a night, and a day. In, order, in other words, three rounds to find that city. Because I'm playing by myself, I have two days and two nights. So four rounds to get this done. So if you want to, you can rush it, but I recommend kind of stopping to, you know, smell the flowers and fight the ogres all along the way. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna choose tactics. So every round you play of Mage Knight, you're gonna choose a tactic, and those represent player order, in the case of us, the dummy player, but they also give you a special bonus that you can use for the entirety of that round. Pull out our day tactics. They don't have to be in any particular order. You can just look at them and pick whichever one you want. It's not like we're fighting with anyone. We have just a W player to time us. So early bird lets you go first, gives you nothing. Tactic two, rethink, says when you take this tactic, discard up to three cards, including wounds from your hand, and then draw that many cards. Shuffle your discard pile back into your deed deck. So basically if you draw an opening hand that you don't like, uh, then you can use this tactic to um, to give yourself a little bit of a reset. Here we have Mana Steal. So when you take this tactic, you can take one mana die of a basic color from the source and put it on this card, and then you can use that mana on any of your turns this day. If you do, re-roll it at the end of that turn and return it to the source. So basically it lets you grab 
a mana that you know you're going to want because the kinds of cards you're you're pulling and it lets you kind of guarantee that you're going to be able to play one of those for its better power because you need mana to power that that part of your skill our number four here is called planning it says at the end of each turn if you have at least two cards in your hand before you draw draw as if your hand limit is one higher so basically it increases your card draw which makes the round go by faster because you're going through your cards faster but it also gives you access to more cards at once which leads to bigger actions per turn Great start. It's one of my favorites. When you take this tactic, immediately draw two cards. And then number six, the right moment. One time this day during your turn, you could announce that you will take another turn immediately after this. So this can be good if your dummy deck is going fast, I guess, but this is really more of a competitive play one in my opinion. Because sometimes you just want to keep that tempo. So I actually already know which one I'm going to want because I like to start off with Number five, great start, which will give me seven cards of draw this turn. Basically what will happen is that I have this for this turn. It's going to go back to the box at the end. Uh, but the dummy player is going to randomly draw a tactic card, and it will determine the order we play in. So they drew Mana Steal. It's a three. They're not going to steal any mana. But uh, we are going to just run the dummy deck really quick because they have the first turn this round. All right, so I've got my great start tactic drawn. All right, so let's draw our opening hand. My opening hand number is normally five, as evidenced by my little shield here that's telling you that I'm in level one to two. But I'm gonna get to draw an extra two cards because I picked great start as my tactic. So I got swiftness, which lets me move or do a range attack. March, which is move or power it up to move more. Crystallize, which is basically a way of manipulating mana to get some crystals in my inventory, which is good. Promise. Influence two or four, depending on how I power it. Influence is used to higher units, which I may or may not be doing soon. We'll see. Tranquility is a healing card. I don't need it yet. So that would have been my regular opening hand. And then we're adding Threaten for influence two or more if I'm willing to take a reputation loss, which maybe I am. And then Rage, which is attack or block. So I have a little bit of everything in this hand, and we'll see how I want to end up playing it. Meanwhile, the dummy player technically goes first. So let's just run through a quick dummy turn. So I'm using Goldix's deck. Basically for the dummy player, it's just to run through their deck. We just draw three cards. One, two, three. And so see how this is blue, and there's one blue crystal in Goldix's inventory right now. That just means that we draw one more card. And that was the entirety of the dummy player's turn. So they're just running through this deck so that we can't sit and just kind of fart around for the entire game. All right, so it's my go. Let's figure out what we are going to do with these cards. Okay, well, one of my big things I'd like to do is I'd like to get to about here. Because this is a village, you can do stuff in villages, and it's right next to an enemy, and I think that we need to think about taking out an enemy because that's always a great idea. And it's also got some exploration possibilities up here. I could go this way, but it's actually more movement to go into the forest, so probably not. All right, so the first thing I want to think about is movement. So when you take a turn in Mage Knight, you can move and take an action. You can take an action, or you can just move as much as you want. But you can never move after you've taken your action. So I could never do something like move up here, attack do something, and then keep going. That is not an option in Mage Knight. So when you are planning out your turns, do not plan to move after doing anything, unless you're planning to make this a multi-turn affair. Movement always happens first. And movement in Mage Knight is something that is a little bit special because you think, oh, move one means I just get to move one hex, right? Wrong. That is not how Mage Knight works. So we're gonna pull our day board over here so you can have a look. So Mage Knight requires different numbers of movement points to move into different types of terrain. And that terrain is going to be marked on the board by specific symbols and shapes. So it's pretty easy to determine. But moving on the plains is two. Moving into a city is two. Everything other than that costs a little bit more. So if I want to move straight through this forest, it's going to cost me three movement points to do that. Two to move into here. And then another two to move here. Basically, there's always a cost for every move, and you have to play your cards well and efficiently so you're getting enough move points without maybe overspending. Because you have to think about that. You don't want to play too many of your cards. You cannot 
go on water. You may not move into water, you may not end your turn on water, so that's why there is an X on it. Also interesting is that here in the forest, it's three to move in there in the day and five to move in the desert during the day. But see these little blue numbers? That's because at night, these are gonna switch because it's harder to move around in a forest at night, but easier to move around in the desert because it's not as hot. So with this in mind, I wanna get here and maybe have enough points left over to do some exploration. So I need to think about how much move that's actually gonna cost. You pay the movement cost of the train you're going into and you ignore the one that you're leaving. So if I wanted to go all the way up here and explore, I would need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine movement to actually reveal a tile. So let's look at the movement that I have and see if that's even possible. So the other thing that's interesting about Mage Knight is that you can play cards for a number of different purposes even if they are not those express purposes. But let's get a big fat chunk of movement. Let's say that I want to play a march for its higher power, which is move four. I need a green mana to power it. And if you remember, I rolled a green mana when I rolled my source dice. You can use one mana die from the source per turn, only one. So in this case, let's say that on this turn, I would like to use my green mana die. And that is gonna give me a total of move four. I'm trying to get to nine. I don't know if I'm actually gonna make it, but it's worth seeing what I can do. So then I'm gonna play swiftness, which is move two. So that's a total of six movement. Then I don't actually have any more movement cards left in my hand. However, if I play any of my cards sideways, that counts as one movement. So if I want a total of nine movement, I can choose to put three of these cards sideways in my play area and have that be three more points of movement to get what I want. Two of my cards are an easy discard because Crystallize requires you to pay one mana of a basic color and then gain a crystal of that color to your inventory. And I've already paid a mana from the source. I don't have any mana crystals right now, which are something that we'll gain, and I don't have any mana in my play area. So this card is useless to me except as something to play sideways. So that's movement point number seven. I don't need to heal right now, so I can just ditch this card. Movement point number eight. And then for number nine, I'm just gonna give up one more of these cards. So I have two cards that give me some influence. I'm going to a town. So basically I have to decide, do I wanna keep my attacky card or do I wanna keep my influency cards? Because I would like to do two things when I get to this village. I wanna see if I can hire a unit, which requires influence, and I wanna fight this dude, which requires some attack. However, I have more cards that let me attack things than influence things, so I'm going to take a risk and I'm gonna pay Rage for nine and keep these for the next turn. So I have move four, powered by this mana, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've made all of my movement happen. So I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then to explore, I pay two more, eight, nine. So that's all my movement spent. So now I'm gonna reveal the next tile on our little tile deck and see what we see. So this will be tile number three. We're gonna orient the number the way that we always do. And we're gonna stick it right here in the middle. So I've got space for two more tiles on either side or I can kind of keep going. But that's one of our tiles explored. And don't forget, we have to get through this whole deck of tiles to find a city, so exploration is pretty key. We also now have two towns that are right next to each other, which is cool. And we've got some other little exciting things on the board that we'll talk about. So here we have a keep, and we're gonna grab a gray keep token and put it there, face down for now. So we're gonna put this token face down, note that it's gray and has a keep on the back, so it goes in the space with a keep on it, yeah. So we don't get to see what's here. If I want to know what's in the keep and think about you know, messing with it a little bit, then I'm gonna have to either get one space away from it in the day so I can like peek over and see what's in there, or if it's nighttime, I have to just take a risk and go ahead and assault the keep and hope for the best. So there's definitely a little bit of risk. There's a lot of planning that's possible in Mage Knight, but it's also a no risk, no reward kind of game where sometimes you have to go into combat situations and you don't really know what you need to get out. That can always be pretty exciting. For now though, 
I'm actually gonna end my turn here. So I made this massive move. I have two cards left in my hand and I actually want to hang on to them because I wanna see if I can get a little bit more influence. I can't spend any more dice from the source this time, which means that I can't power up either of these. And I wanna see what else I draw because I would really like to purchase maybe even these Utum Crossbowmen. They cost six influence. And if I can get six, that'd be great. But if I can't, I just can't. So before I clean up, one other thing happens because I revealed this tile, and it's something that only happens in the first reconnaissance scenario. In first reconnaissance, you get a fame for discovering a new tile. So my fame is gonna go up to one. That means that two fame from now, I'm gonna level up, which is something that needs to happen fast. All right, so that was my first turn. I'm gonna go ahead and clean up. So all of these cards are gonna go into my discard pile. I'm just gonna stick it over here under my tactic cards and that'll all get reset. And then I'm gonna draw back up to my hand limit, which is five. So I have two cards in my hand right now, three. Ooh, I got a special Tovet card, Instinct. Ooh, four with some sweet attacks. And five, Rage, which will give me attack or block two. So I've got some potential for some cool actions coming up and we'll see what I can do. One of the things that's hardest about Mage Knight is that your desire to do stuff where you are and your need to move on will conflict with each other. But I'm not in a hurry. We do well or we don't, whatever. I'm just showing you mechanics. So now it's Goldix the Dummy Deck's turn again. We're gonna go one, two, three. Once again, we've got a blue and there's one blue crystal in the inventory. So we drew one more card. So Goldix is moving but not really faster than we are, so it's okay. The other thing that we need to do before we uh, start the turn again is re-roll this green mana die. So we got another green and we'll just put it back in the source where we have a green, a white, and a gold. That's actually good for me. I got some plans. So I think what I want to do this time is let's have a quick turn. So remember, you can only do one action per turn. So I can either interact with this village or get into a scuffle with this enemy. And I think that my best move is to go ahead and get a unit first and then start to scuffle. I think that's what I want. Then I'll do some more exploring. Because I know I want to recruit someone, I might as well do it here. And I can't move right now. I can't move this way anyway, because there's an enemy here. If I move from here to here, I'm moving from a space that's adjacent to a rampaging enemy to another space that's adjacent to a rampaging enemy and it will provoke an attack. So rather than upset them right now, I'm just gonna chill out in the village, you know, have a coffee, look for some people to hire, let's do it. So I actually have good hiring prospects and then I have a good opportunity to attack next turn. So I think that will all go just fine. What we're gonna do is we are going to play Promise and we're gonna power it with a white mana. So it was already influence two, but by paying the white mana from the source, it's now influence four. That's excellent for us. So I have four influence. I want six to hire my Utum crossbowman. So I'm going to play threaten for influence two. I could, if I had, I could have played the gold because it's wild. I could have played for influence five, but my reputation would have taken a hit. So let's just not do that. I have influence four, influence two, for a total of six influence, which allows me to hire these Utem crossbowmen. They are cool because they can either attack or block for three, or they have a range attack of two. I really like range attacks so I can get them in. So I'm gonna go ahead and put them right here. So this shield marks that I can only have one crossbowman right now, but as I level up, I'll be able to gain more because as these shields come off the pile, they become more spots for me to have units. All right, so after buying the crossbowmen, we're just gonna refill our offer. Ooh, some Northern Monks. We'll have to think about that for a future turn. So one unit for now, but more later. I've got three cards left, but the thing is I wanna take my action next turn. So this is, I think some people would like to play faster, but I'm content to just fart around or waste time. Um, so I am going to hold on to these cards and have a nice fat attack and block around next turn walking through combat. So for now, I'm saying that I'm done. I'm going to stay in the town because I don't, I can't move. I could, I would have had to move at the start of the turn. I did an action. I can't do any more actions. So that's that. These cards go on my discard. 
going to reroll this die. So this time we have a blue mana. And that one's going to hang out a source. And then I'm going to draw back up to five so I can pick up two more cards. One, two. Okay, so this time I got March, which is good because I want to move soon, not yet. And mana draw. I can use one additional mana die from the source this turn. Woo hoo hoo. So mana draw gives me the ability to pump my magic up a little bit. So we'll see what we can do. Now it's the dummy dex turn. What you doing, Gildix? One, two, three. Another blue. Ah, so it'll go four. So there was only one blue crystal. If it was green, we'd be drawing two extra cards per turn and it would accelerate, which wouldn't be as good. But we got a little bit more play left in this round. So I'm just going to milk this day for all it's worth. Now it's back to us. I don't know about y'all, but I sure feel like fighting. So it's going to be us versus this token right here. So I'm going to zoom on in and we're going to talk about combat. All right, so we're starting off with a fairly basic combat round. Things get a lot more complicated later, but we're not going to worry about it for the moment. So here's what I need. I need to generate three attack to kill this thing. Only three. It hits for four, which means that if I end up having to block it, then I'll have to block for four. If I beat it, I get two fame. Basically, the top number is what you need to kill it. The left number is what it needs to hurt you. And the bottom number is the amount of fame that you gain for taking it out. Hopefully that part makes sense so far. So let's have a look at the cards that I have and think about combat. So with movement, with influence, and with combat, I can play non-combat cards or non-influence cards or non-movement cards sideways for one point, but I should have enough attack to handle this business. The question is exactly how do I want to do it? So combat takes place across four rounds, basically. There's the ranged and siege attack phase. So if I have enough range, I can just kill this thing right off, but I don't believe that I do in my hand. Then there's the block phase where the enemy attacks me and I have to see how many wounds, if any, I will take. The assigned damage phase. So any enemies that did attack, I have to assign damage to myself or to a unit. And then there's the attack phase where I get to swing at them. And combat can happen in a series of these until somebody gets dead. So let's have a look at the cards that I have for right now. So I have move two, influence two, attack two, or block two. I could power it up with my gold mana for more, but I don't know if that's going to be necessary. Other options include cold toughness. So I can attack two or ice block for three. So I do have a lot of block going on here. I have my mana draw, which will help me power whatever I want. I have rage, which is attack or block two. So again, attack or block. And then I have march, which is like a movement card. I'm hoping not to spend this because I do want to get some movement going next turn. So I think that with between these cards and also my unit, I'm actually fine. I'm not gonna have to take any damage or do much of anything at all. This should not be a big deal. So I think what we are going to do, we don't have any ranged attack because we only have two and I would have needed three to make it so. That's okay because I have plenty of attack and I have plenty of block. So the siege and range attack phase is already over because I know it's not gonna happen. Now we're into the block phase. This thing hits for four with block. You can't partially block damage. It's really an all or nothing thing. You either block and don't get hit or you don't block and you do get hit. There is no, you know, oh, well, I blocked three out of four. So I only, nope, you block it or you didn't. So that's something that can be irritating, I think, if you want to, you know, get hurt less. But in terms of simplicity, it's there. How do I want to block? That's a good question. So let's see what I have going on. I need to block for four, and then I need to attack for three, which means that I'm gonna use up all three of these cards and either some mana or my unit, and I need to decide what I think is the best. Here's what I think we can do. I like this, I like this a lot. So Cold Toughness, Cold Toughness has a special power. It's a lot of small text, so let me read it. If I power it with a blue mana, which I do have in the source, it says, I get ice block five, get plus one ice block for each ability or color of attack depicted on the enemy token you block, unless it has arcane immunity, or for each mana spent by an opponent during the attack. 
So I don't actually need to worry about that because I'm gonna get plenty of ice block from just powering this card, which is what I think I'm gonna do. So let's do that. We are going to go ahead and ice block. So for my block phase, I don't have to play any of these other cards. I just pay this blue mana on the card to make my block ice block five. So this thing hits for four, I have block for five. Oh, you miss me, too bad enemy, ah, ha ha ha. So if I'd taken damage, I would assign it now. You can assign damage to yourself or you can just assign it to a unit, but it didn't happen, wah ha ha. So now I can hit this thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and play rage for attack two, instinct for attack two, and then this thing is donezo. I killed it because I only needed to get up to three. So the enemy is dead, and now we talk about the aftermath of that. All right, so now that this enemy has died, you know what, let's just go ahead and clean up really quick. So I'm gonna not do anything else this turn because I can't move. I did my action. Oh, I could have moved here maybe, but eh, no, forget it. I'm gonna go for a big fat move next time. So we'll reroll this in a second. These all go into discard. Let's just, let's just reroll it. All right, so that's a green. This dice is a little messed up. And then, we are going to get the reward for beating this enemy. So let's bring our little fame tracker over. So we defeated a rampaging enemy, the ones with the swords on the back. That means that the people around here like that. So our reputation goes up by one spot. It doesn't change anything yet. We're still at zero, but if my reputation continues to grow, I'll get influence, which helps me hire people in towns. Uh, if my reputation goes bad and I start getting negatives, then I can, then I'll have a deficit when I'm trying to pay influence to hire people. And if I'm bad enough, I can't interact with anyone at all until I've thought about what I did a little bit. So we took out our enemy and we got two fame for doing it. Boom, so that puts us at three fame. That was just enough to level up. And we're gonna need some more fame to get another level up because leveling up is important. So here we are, we get a specific reward for this level. So next level, we'll get another shield token and be able to hire another unit. But this level, this symbol, means we get one card. So we get an advanced action card, yes! And we get a skill token. Skill tokens are so fun. Let's go through the process of picking our new treasures because that's basically the best part of the game. Honestly, I love getting new stuff. All right, so first, advanced actions. Let's look at the ones that are on the offer because they are cool. All right, here are our choices, friends. We get either regeneration, blood rage, or ice bolt. This is the one that was on the bottom of the column that does matter for resetting the round. I do remember, do not worry. Okay, ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, so regeneration is good if you plan to get hurt, which happens. We'll think about it. Blood rage is pretty bomb. Also, it has disgusting art, which I love. So this is attack two. If I take a wound, I can increase to attack five. Um, if I take, if I use a red mana, I can take a wound to increase this to attack nine. So basically blood rage is like being a berserker. That is cool. These are my cards. One of these will be mine. Ice bolt is gain a blue crystal to your inventory. And if you, so this one's kind of cool because it's a card that powers itself. If you already have a blue mana, you can use ranged ice attack three. That's cool. I like it. I like it. But the other thing that's neat about that is that in order to keep powering the card, if you don't have access to blue mana, you can get a blue crystal in your inventory that just kind of keeps from round to round. And then when you're ready to use the card again, pow, you have a blue mana. So that's nice. These are all very good cards. But what do I want? What do I want, guys? Often I'll pick the ranged attack, but I think I'm feeling some blood rage today. So for those of you who like Blood Rage, just remember, this is the real Blood Rage, okay? Best game ever, Mage Knight. So let's take this Blood Rage card because it's awesome. Uh, attack two, you can take a wound to increase this to attack five. Attack four, you can take a wound to increase it to attack nine. And the best part is I get to put it on the top of my draw deck, so I get it next round, Woohoo! I find this thrilling. So these are gonna go back. Basically what's gonna happen is um, they were like this with Blood Rage in the middle, so this will slide down and I'll just put another card up. So now we're gonna reset our advanced actions. Basically Blood Rage was here when I took it. So we're gonna slide regeneration down and we're gonna draw a new card. 
And this time we got agility. Good stuff. Also, since it will matter for end of round, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull some magical spells. Mist form. Charm. Cure. We can't buy these yet, but they will matter when I have to change up the dummy deck in a few turns. So whether or not I get a spell, I should have them. So now that we've leveled up, the other thing that we get to gain is a skill. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get to pull two random skill tokens from Tovac's skill pile and see which one we want. All right, so here are two of those skill tokens that we talked about when we did setup. And these are, so if you don't know, what the skills are, which I don't remember either. You just look at this handy dandy card that tells you, yay. So we have, this one is, I feel no pain. So if I take this one, once a turn except in combat, I can discard a wound from my hand to draw a card. That's cool. This one is shield mastery. Once a turn, I can block three or I can ice block or fire block for two. So those are just a couple special block types that are pretty cool. This is neat, but I really want this. This is great. So I'm gonna take this and have super special blocking power once per turn. So basically whenever I have combat, that is cool. Love it. This one is going to be basically blocked from my chosen. I can't get this back. I've chosen not to take it. And the other thing that's going to interplay is next time I get to choose a skill, I could take one of Goldix's. So that's the other thing the dummy player is for. They time you around, but they also give you access to another hero's skills, which is pretty cool. If mage knights can be called heroes, we don't really know. So Goldix's skills now in the offer for next time. So I'll just put these aside and we will continue play. All right, so y'all have seen some exciting things. You have seen combat. You have seen a village where I hired somebody. You can also buy healing points there, but I didn't need it at the time. And now I think that we should make our way up here and see what kind of trouble we can make at this keep because why not? That is my question. So we've got these two cards and then we're gonna draw back to five. All right, so let's draw up to five again. So one, two, three. Oh, lots of movement. Okay, and Blood Rage, what a shocker. I didn't expect to see that card so soon. <laughs> all right, so we have all of our cards for our hand. Now let's just do a quick dummy deck turn. We're getting close to end of round here. One, two, three. It's a white crystal. So basically next turn the dummy deck player will have one card and then the next turn they'll have no cards and they'll declare end of round regardless of what I do. So I only have a couple rounds left. So let's make the most of them. I'm also running low though so I'm probably going to declare end of round soon myself. There's only two cards left in this deck. Okay here's what I would like. I want to move up here the, so there's two reasons. One is I want to see what's in this keep. The other reason is that I want to reveal tiles and this is in a space where I'm pretty sure that would connect to two tiles so I could reveal two. That seems good to me. So let's do that. I need to plan for one, two, three, four, five, six movement and then maybe at least eight, ten if I can get it. That'd be pretty good. I do have a lot of move in this hand. We might as well go for broke. So let's see what I'm working with. This is for attacking leader. I'm just gonna hold on to that. But I've got some pretty sweet movement powers going. So, 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 so. I have March. I'm gonna go ahead and use a green to power that to four movement, four. Let's do, this is risky, but we're gonna do it anyway. So we're gonna, we're gonna play move four. So I have a card called Mana Draw. That lets me use one additional mana die from the source this turn, and I want to. Normally you're only allowed to use one, but I'm going to use Mana Draw to pull a second one. I'm gonna use this gold, because it's wild during the day, as a blue. So that's gonna be move eight. And then this stamina, I'm gonna play for two move, nine, 10. Ooh, got 10 movement, rung it out. So four, eight, 10. Mana, mana, no mana. Got to do two from the source, normally can't because I use mana draw. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This lets us look at what's in here. Peaky peaky, oh, hello. So I would really like to have some block to deal with this guy. We'll see 
what happens. We'll see, we'll see. Okay, so now I can use my other two movements each. So I've done two, four, six movements. And I can use two to reveal this tile and two to reveal a tile up, which I am all about. Let's do it. So let's draw this tile. This is tile number four. It will go like this. I do believe, yes. And then for two more points, I can do tile five. And we're gonna get our first monastery. Hello. How does this go? Yeah, that's how it goes. You can see me matching the shapes up. That's, that's how that works. Look at these amazing possibilities before me. I like it. Also, we're gonna have to set some stuff out. We got some wandering, rampaging enemies that we need to take care of setting them out on the board. All right, so I've pulled a couple more of these tokens and let's put them down and then see what they are. So put down, put down. All right, so this one is uh, some wolf riders. This one is gonna be some diggers. And what's interesting is they both have special combat abilities, so we can talk about that, which I think is good. Good, good, good. And there's a monastery, we should definitely make our way here. All right, so something exciting happens now that we have revealed a monastery. So we have advanced actions over here, but the other thing that's gonna happen is that we're gonna come up to our advanced action deck, we're gonna pull another one, and we're gonna put it in the offer because you get an extra advanced action just available on the market, and you get one for every monastery that you reveal on the map. The other special thing for first reconnaissance that I don't wanna forget, but you don't normally do it in Mage Knight, is that because I just revealed two tiles, I'm gonna get two more fame. So we're up to five fame, and in the three more, we can level up, which is imminent, because we're gonna take on this keep, come hell or high water. It could be a bad choice, don't care. But for now, my turn is over, and we are gonna do a little cleanup. So let's reroll our dice. All right, a red and a gold, that's promising. And we only have two more cards to draw. So we're gonna grab them, and that's it. So we have blood rage, we have swiftness, we have concentration. All right, and then these are all gonna to go to discard. And we are going to close out our dummy deck. So I just popped the last card from the deck on top. But what that means is that next round they would declare end of round. But um, I'm out of cards anyway, so I would basically play my turn and announce end of round myself next turn. So we're about even, no problem. Okay, so I've got these three cards and the question is what do I wanna do? So I have choices. I can choose to attack right now and take out this keep. Like I know I'll win, but I also know that I'm gonna take a bunch of wounds if I do that. And I would kind of like to play for time and get a little bit more block hopefully before I do that. Because I have three block off my Utsum Crossbowman. So this unit can give me three block, but I need six. And so when you get hurt in Mage Knight, it is not fun. I only have two armor. So what that means is that if I get hit for six, that means I take one wound and then six minus two is four. Four is still bigger than zero, so I take one more wound. Four minus two is two. Still, two is still bigger than zero. And then I take one more wound and then two minus two is zero, so the pain stops. But I'm gonna take three wounds off of this thing if I attack it now. And if I can get more block, like more cards in my hand to do something with the blocking, I think that's probably smarter. The other thing is that I have to move into a keep to assault it, which means that I need more movement too. So in Mage Knight, it seems like you can just attack anything because the first things that you attack are these rampaging monsters. But what you actually do is you ascend and you basically mount the hill on which there is a keep or a mage tower. So you have to move into the space to fight one of these one of these kinds of units. So that means that um, right now I don't really have the movement or I could get it, but that would not be great. So we will just kind of wait this out. So instead, let's use the move that I do have because I can get enough to get here. So we're going into this hilly area. That's gonna be three movement. And so I need three movement points to go in there. Move two, 
play sideways for move three. So we're just gonna come and end our turn here because we're on a blue crystal mine and that means that I will get a blue crystal. So remember those cards with the city on the back that help. Here's the one for crystal mines. It says, mining. If you end your turn on a mine, gain one mana crystal of the color that mine produces to your inventory. So this is also an opportunity to talk to y'all about something else cool in this game, and that is crystals. So this is a blue mine. I just ended my turn there. I'm gonna get to take a blue mana crystal and put it in my inventory. In other words, here on this card. So you might have noticed that most mana I've spent up to this point is mana that comes from the source. And that's mana that's a little bit more random. You can only use one die at a time unless you have a special card. That is not great. So one way to get more mana is to either have cards that let you gain crystals to your play area, in which case you have to play them that turn, or you have cards that let you gain to your inventory. So I just gave a blue crystal to my inventory, which means I can just sit on that until I decide that I need it. So the other thing to note is that you can really only have crystals in your inventory that are of basic colors. So red, blue, white, green, uh, gold, and black mana are considered unstable. So you might be able to get a crystal to your play area and push the kind of mana that you can use on a turn, but you cannot store it in your inventory. That's basic colors only. So when you take a mana crystal to your inventory, if you get a choice of color, you do not get to choose gold or black. All right, so I did my turn on this nice crystal mine. I got a crystal, and that's basically all I'm going to be able to do. These cards that I used to move are gonna go into discard. And then sadly, end of round has come. I don't have any more cards to draw. They're gonna declare end of round. It's end of round. So I do have this card left over. Sadly, I don't get to keep it. I have to reset everything. But this is gonna come back, hopefully soon, so we can go wreck some keeps and some enemies on the way to a city. So I'm gonna need to probably pick up the pace a little bit. I got time. I need one, two, three, up to six more explorations, but if the city is earlier, then I don't actually have to, I'm, I'm pretty close to finding a city anyway. Might as well enjoy the ride. So we're gonna switch over to nighttime now. So let's do the stuff that we can do over here and then I'll move the camera and we'll look at the other setup and then I'll move it back. So there's one other thing that I forgot to do, and that is put a token on this mage tower. It is cool, mage towers are the best. So just like the keep, except with a different token, I'm gonna put a purple mage tower token here. And this is another one of those tokens where you have to get close during the day to see what's there. I'm not close during the day. We're about to enter a night round. So I might have to just work my way over there tonight and like assault it and just see what happens because it's fun and it's mage night and that's exactly what you should be doing. So. Reset continuing. All right, so now it's time for a day-night reset. What's gonna happen is that first, let's just set from day to night. So it was day, now it's night. And we need to re-roll the mana dice. So let's see what we get for this night. Okay, so this is great. We got a red, a green, and a blue. So the special mana changes at night. So just so for example, at the daytime, gold was wild and it was awesome. Now it's depleted if we get it, so we don't really want that. So let's, uh, let's be glad that we rolled all basic colors. What black mana basically does is it's not a wild like gold. We're about to discard the spell anyway, but see this spell? I really want one of these next turn, by the way, so we are headed over to that mage tower. So there are two options on this spell. You got Mist Form and Veil of Mist. Mist Form is powered by just a blue. Veil of Mist, which is the more powerful form of the spell, is powered by a blue mana and a black one. So black isn't wild, but what it does is it gives you access to a more powerful version of your spells. All right, so switch from day to night, reroll the mana, excellent. Next, what we're gonna do is all of these units that are on offer, we didn't hire them, now they go away. They go to the bottom of the deck, and then we draw the top three. More Utum Crossbowmen, not gonna cry. And Foresters. Okay, so these are pretty cool, I'm down. Um, this advanced action that was on the market because of the monastery is also going to go to the bottom of its respective pile. So it goes to the bottom. We'll pull another one off the top. So now Crushing Bolt is available at monasteries for six influence, that might be worth, that's a great card. Next, we're gonna kind of rotate these rows. So the bottom of our market, Ice Bolt, is also gonna go to the bottom of the advanced action pile. Regeneration and agility are gonna slide down and we're gonna draw from the top for refreshing walk. 
So these are the currently available advanced actions if we level up. Spells do the same thing. Now that we have a Mage Tower out, spells are relevant. We're in this game, let's do it. So we have Mist Form. This one's gonna go away, just like the others. These are gonna come down and we're gonna pull the top spell off of the spell pile. This has one more, this has one more job to do, however. See how this is a blue mana? What that means is that we're gonna add a blue crystal to the Demi deck. So it had, it started with two green crystals and one blue. We're gonna take a blue crystal and add it to Goldix's inventory so that now if we draw three cards and the third one is blue, we'll draw two more cards instead of just one. So when you cycle spells at the end of your round, it makes the dummy player play faster and tightens your timer. 